Welcome to Span 312 Hopscotch, Latin American Literature in Translation. And I'm very, very pleased to have with me John Beverly, Professor John Beverly, Emeritus of the University of Pittsburgh, where he taught for a, a long time at a very important uh, Center for Latin American uh, Studies. Uh, John has written very extensively on everything from actually uh, the Hispanic Baroque, but I guess he's best known for what he's done on, on Latin America. This is a, a book on uh, subalternity and, and representation, a, a key text uh, in the field. He's also well known for what he's written about testimonial and uh, his involvement in the debates around testimonial, uh, particularly this book, which we're going to focus on today, which is I, Rigoberto Menchu, an Indian woman in Guatemala, that's the English translation, me llamo Ricoberto Menchu, y así me nació la conciencia. John, thank you so much for your time and generosity uh, to do this. And I'll start with a very open question. How would you suggest approaching a text such as Rigoberto Menchu's? Thanks. Thanks for having me on this, John. Uh, well, uh, testimonial presents itself, I think, in the field of literature and the humanities generally, initially as a kind of a prop, uh, because it appears as journalism on the one hand, or as uh, what social scientists call oral history on the other hand. But it's not exactly journalism. It's a book. It's a book-length uh, narrative, or somewhat autobiographical narrative, usually. Uh, and uh, it's not really oral history in the sense that oral histories, it, it, they can look the same, but an oral history is generally summed up by a social scientists or something like that to be a part of his or her larger narrative. So we interviewed people in this place and they told us this, that, and the other thing, and here's a quote from one, here's a quote from No, it's meant to stand alone as possessing its own power of narrative authority. And uh, so it's not, it's not subsidiary in that sense to uh, uh, academic projects in the way oral history is. And, and often it has a, a, indeed a commercial life of its own. Uh, in Venezuela, some testimonials became TV series, for example. Uh, uh, Ricoberto Manchu has become sort of an, in, or became for a while, a kind of international bestseller or cause celeb for a while, especially when she won the Nobel Prize for Peace uh, in 1990, maybe something like that. Uh, clearly, that was related to her, uh, uh, to the um, reception of her uh, testimonial and the way it was spread by academics like myself and people in human rights movements and in Guatemala movements, Central America movements. It got, kind of got spread. Uh, but in its origin for me as a literary critic, the question of testimonial was primarily a literary question. When you start reading things or becoming aware of things like Enrico Berta Menchu, then you look around your library and you start pulling down. And that was what I did in my first article. In I started pulling out books that I thought fit an idea that I hadn't quite formulated yet of testimonial, but Rigoberto Manchu was kind of the model. And I discovered about 40, including a book by William Burroughs called Junkie. And uh, some of them were about criminal life, not about uh, guerrillas or politically correct people, but but they all had this quality of being, I think my definition was, so I, I had to define testimonial as a genre. That's a literary critical problem, right? If it's not just journalism and it's not oral history and it's not fiction, clearly, but it has somewhat of a character of a fictional narrative of taking you through a piece of time and a, a sequence of events, 
maybe with a bit of a Bildungsroman put into it, the no a novel of formation. The narrator is changing as the narration goes on. Uh, I thought maybe this is a new genre, or at least that's the way I was thought to think about it initially. And then I arrived at a definition, which is that a testimonial is a novel or novel-length narration told in the first person by a narrator who is also a witness or protagonist to the events that he or she narrates. That was my definition, right? Uh, because often these narrators come from either it's subaltern sectors where literacy is not presumed or, or not widespread, or if they are literate, uh, require some kind of intermediation to get their story out in a printed form, uh, there's usually the, an interlocutor involved who's a writer or journalist or something like that, who then kind of puts a testimonial into shape and arranges it for it to get published. In the case of Rigo Vertamenshu, that was a Venezuelan anthropologist, Elizabeth Burgos, the wife of the famous uh, French revolutionary uh, uh, Regis Debray, right? Ex wife. Uh, uh, so I think that role of intermediation is important too. Uh, the testimonial is not a thing in itself, even though I do define it as a genre. It's always in a relational sense. Uh, it, all, it almost always involves an intermediation of some sort uh, by a person from a different social situation or class than the, than the narrator. Um, so, and that introduces problems, right? Yeah. So, so I wonder, as you say, it's not as if there weren't precedents to a book such as Rigoberto's, um, uh, even with the use of intermediaries, for instance, uh, Esteban Montejo, um, the uh, his autobiography, biography, autobiography in the 1960s in, in Cuba. What do you think it was in the 1980s? What was going on in the 1980s? Uh, that suddenly there was this intense interest in an explosion uh, uh, of testimonials in Latin America, especially perhaps, but but also elsewhere. And why do you think it at the same time ran into such opposition at the uh, very very soon after the e emergence of interest in in this genre? I think the main thing is, I mean, we wouldn't have called it this in the 80s, but I think the main thing in the 80s was globalization or the you know, beginnings of globalization of Latin American economies. I mean, in retrospect, we can look back and see the Guatemalan Civil War that Manchu talks about or the Proceso in Argentina or m many other processes. Uh, certainly Allende, uh, the defeat of Allende in Chile and the dictatorship there as initial moves in a general process of neoliberal and globalist transformation of Latin America, but also of many other parts of the world. So globalization lays bare, it seems to me, uh, the, almost like a river that scoured out uh, vegetation and sediment it was there now you see bare spots uh and those bare spots are usually of people who are really being screwed by globalization or have fallen between the cracks in some kind of way uh, the, the the other thing i guess is that the 80 is the period and and they're related of course uh the period of collapse, uh, relative collapse of the left in Latin America, right? Uh, Cuba gets into deeper and deeper trouble and becomes less and less exemplary. I mean, one could be kind to Cuba, but it's clearly not a model of any kind of socialist society that anybody today would want to aspire to, not even the Cubans, right? They call it a special period in times of emergency to say we aren't exemplary we're just trying to survive you know uh, without giving up everything uh so that collapse of the left and of the pretense of a uh, of a left 
culture kind of represented by 60s Nueva Trova and you know, revolution Cuban posters and all that kind of uh, leftist Mexican uh, graffiti. Uh, that meant that we we could no longer think of uh, uh, traditional left wing parties or formations as necessarily being representative of the wide range of social positions that might be mobilized. Uh, to struggle against globalization or to struggle for some kind of structural transformation of society. Now, it's fallen out of touch, the narrative of uh, narrative transculturation, which had really been the basic ideology of left American art up to and through the 60s, right? Uh, uh, Diego Rivera, et cetera, you know, uh, his wife, uh, uh, the novels, the great novels of Garcia Marquez, uh, they were all examples, we were told, of, of narrative transculturation. We believe that. And that what's being produced there is a new revolutionary or radical form of Latin American culture that points to a future state that will be inclusive of all the excluded minorities and social positions. That was a basic idea. That idea, I think, comes into crisis. Uh, but, because, but, yeah, go ahead. But from this crisis, so there's the, uh, as you're putting it, the, the, the lack of faith in in those those narratives, the traditional left wing, partly because of circumstances of defeats in in places like Chile, broader trends such as globalization. But in testimonio, and we were talking about this a little bit before we started recording, you and others also saw the emergence of a new subjectivity. In other words, it wasn't just a, a chronicle of defeats. You saw it as something with 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 potential, with a, perhaps a different kind of future, maybe not utopian in the same way as those narratives of the 1960s or the early 1970s. That's correct. Uh, I, I think what we sense in testimonial was not only the presence of uh, of new political subjects. Maybe they weren't so new. Maybe it was just like in my metaphor of the river before they were there, but we didn't see them because we were thinking in terms of parties or unions or national movements or something like that. We weren't thinking in terms of... Uh, street people in Caracas, you know, or peasants who were being ground down by uh, big agriculture in places like what, Indian peasants. Uh, we weren't to give Indians really all that much at all, right? Uh, they would sort of follow along. They would be lifted up by acculturation. Uh, but you, you sense in testimonial, uh, and that became part of the theoretical definition of it as a genre, uh, the, the, uh, what one critic called uh, a, a narración de urgencia, a narrative, or an urgent narration. In other words, the very act of telling this story and it appearing to uh, a, a national and then perhaps even international reading public, as was the case with Rigoberta uh, that, that there was some kind of agency implied in that, not just on the part of the person who collected the testimonial, like in the case of the Cuban testimonial you, you mentioned about Esteban, Esteban Montejo. Montejo, yeah. So the collector of that was Miguel, the poet and critic Miguel Barnett, right? And so there's a there's a sort of a war going on with the American translations of uh, who is the author. So in one case. In addition, some years back, it was the autobiography of Esteban Montejo as told to or edited by Miguel Barnett. In other cases, and this is Barnett's own preference, it's Miguel Barnett's book, The Autobiography of a Runaway Slave. Uh, that ambiguity is interesting, but, but it raises the question of what whose intention is being expressed in testimonial. 
and many critics of testimonial uh, attack testimonial for pretending to seem to represent a uh, proletarian or subaltern or whatever uh, minoritarian uh, agency, when in fact it was the agency of the critic in pushing the text and how that helped his or her career and academic politics and stuff like that. That was the main attack against testimony from the left, right? Testimonio isn't really, it's a fake. It's a, it's like a, what it's been like, you know, those puppets that you make talk. Mm -hmm. What do you call them? Ventri ventriloquist. Uh, ventriloquist, yeah. So the voice that was speaking in testimonio was a ventriloquist voice, really the voice of the critic or, uh, but we, uh, I sense uh, I, I, that's a good question to raise. I don't have any problem with that question being raised uh, because it leads into other questions about social authority and cultural authority and so forth and so on. But I, but I also felt that there was an agency of the narrator too involved, and that that that's the urgency, the narrative or that sense that the testimony is somehow bound up with the general biological, political, uh, legal uh, struggle on the part of communities under the impact of, of poverty that's existed for centuries, but now aggravated and modified by globalization to find a voice, to, to express themselves in a, uh, in a way that for some reason or other the left hadn't done adequately. The left has sort of given voice to those people, but as a kind of voiceless mass, you know, uh, of Indians. Maybe there were novels, uh, but we didn't hear their own voices. So, right. as, you, as you've suggested, um, one of the things that happens is that there is a pushback against, again, against lots of things, uh, but testimonial becomes entwined with the so-called culture wars especially in the United States, but not only in the United States, in the 1980s, 1990s, perhaps there's two publications which are sort of symptomatic. One is Dinesh D'Souza, Illiberal Education. We were talking about that earlier. And then a few years later, almost 10 years later, David Stoll's book specifically focused on Rigoberto Menchu. So how do you explain and understand the ways in which testimonial was a I don't know, was a prize or a pawn or a, a target in these culture wars in the 1980s and 1990s? I think to begin with, testimonial caught on rather quickly uh, uh, from something I and many other people had very vague ideas about. It, it suddenly began to crystallize as, as a as a genre and as a theme in Latin American literary and cultural criticism, but not just Latin American. Uh, I would say by the mid to late 80s, it caught on. There were many debates and volumes of, were published, some of them edited by myself. Uh, everybody was talking about it, you know, pro or con. Uh, and, you know, there was some anxiety on the part of perhaps more traditional liberals or leftists as to whether the so-called agency or expression from the subaltern, it, the voice, of the, the voice of an actual person, whether that was made it a kind of puppet or not. Or not. Uh, uh, but that was, the, the problem wasn't that. That was a problem internal to the reception of testimonial and to its massive incorporation into U.S. education, not only at uh, uh, college level classes, maybe in modern Latin America or something like that, could be big classes, you know, but also high school classes in some cases. Uh, uh, there was a book somebody somebody wrote about that incorporating Rigoberto Menchu into the classroom, that was more or less the theme of the book. And, and that was what was scary, I think, for number one, social scientists who still had a 
mainly positivist view of their disciplines. They could be very left wing, and but they didn't really like this idea of people speaking for themselves. It, really, what they said is that most this can be evidence, you know, for a narrative that then we put together. So it ruffled the feathers of historians and anthropologists, and there was a big de debate, remember, about postmodern anthropology, whether it was fair for the anthropologists just to let kind of things happen before him without making an effort to determine what was true and what wasn't. What, what was the problem, though, is that the cultural right in America, which was beginning to reemerge, strongly in the late 80s uh, as an effect of Reagan, Reaganism, uh, began to be concerned, as it is today, with the content of American higher education, particularly in humanities program, and particularly at elite institutions like Stanford. And as, as you recall, Stanford had uh, put or one of the courses in Western civilization that all undergraduates at Stanford had to take. They didn't have to take that particular version, but many of them did, uh, included Rigoberto Manchu in the list of canonic texts of Western civilization, starting I don't know, with the Bible and going through up to Freud and then and then testimonial. Right? Well, that seemed totally scandalous to uh, right wing uh, and some liberal intellectuals because Manchu was sort of chastised as a feminist, I think. Somebody said this. She's a, a historian, a liberal historian. She's a feminist and a communist and something else, you know. Uh, uh, bad things, right? Uh, so that was the, really the question. Should testimonial in general, and Rico Berto Menchu in particular, have the kind of central position in the academic curricul U.S. academic curriculum? Uh, that it had attained. Uh, and that's where D'Souza, Dinesh D'Souza, comes up with an idea of an illiberal education. In other words, Rigoberto Manchu, apart from its literary value, which he felt was zero, right, or minus zero, it's being imposed on students in the name of a political project. So, uh, so that's... So. That Solidarity that it, it's not proper to education. So perhaps if that was the first wave of controversy around a book such as Menchu, the second wave comes with David Stoll and is about truth. I, in fact, it's, it's not the subtitle of your book about Roberto Menchu, The Politics of Truth. I think it is, if I remember correctly. Well, uh, yeah, poli The Politics of Truth is a collection of all the different essays I wrote about testimony over about 20 years uh right so it picks picks up the stole debate sort of midstream yeah it's about truth uh and um so that was a difficult uh negotiation because uh on the one hand you wanted to say uh testimonial represents a kind of truth of experience perhaps because it has to be based by definition on direct experience and witness of direct experience can't be made up it can be made up but then it's a fake testimonial right oh uh, and there are plenty of fake testimonials because the genre was so popular that writers said oh maybe i'm going to write something that looks like a testimonial but actually that i've made up there was a famous mexican one called El Vampirio de la Colonia, Colonia Roma, about a neighborhood in Mexico, which was a gay neighborhood, and it was kind of a testimonial about gay mixing and partying and stuff like that, and a very popular book, but made up by the writer, right, on the basis of his own experiences, but a pseudo-testimonial, we might say. So the assumption that it was testimonial, though, was that we were getting, in some sense or another, Truths, a truth that might not have been available more conventionally through uh, academic social sciences or conventional journalism or history or uh, a new kind of truth, a direct, direct witness. Uh, 
mediated, but still with that imprint of the voice of somebody speaking directly to you. You know, if somebody's in front of you and saying, listen, my life has been a disaster. I need a dollar or something like that. That's a different, it's going to elicit linguistically and ethically a different response than you're hearing about or reading about somebody who suffered a collapse in their lives and needs help because you have to answer directly to a person, right? And uh, no, sorry, I can sneak away or okay, here's the, and in a way, testimonial has creates that kind of ethical and linguistic pressure to the extent you assume it's a real person speaking and, and not simply a fictional creation. Okay, you have an obligation to a real person, uh, even to refuse them, right? But it's an obligation to to respond. So, so on the other hand, uh, testimonial narrators were narrators, right? And and often had a dynamic with the interlocutor about how to shape the story. If they were tape, like we're doing now, tape recording, uh, that tape recording had to be edited and. Uh, and a narrative created out of them, either by the interlocutor or probably in many cases by both interacting in some kind of way, both the narrator and the interlocutor. Uh, so I think social scientists were scared about the uh, the lack of an objective mediation. <laughs> There was a mediation, but it was solidaristic. It was ethical. It was empathetic, kind of Kantian, if you want, uh, uh, do unto others. Uh, uh, but it wasn't the uh, mediation of, of uh, science or a claim of science as such, right? Uh, claim to objectivity, to uh it, and that's what Stoll claimed to be representing. He was saying, look, you guys have been, you've drunk the Kool-Aid, essentially, right? Uh, really, things are much more complicated than when she says she contradicts herself a couple of times in her narrative. Uh, other people have different versions of the same events she talks about, and in general, of the idea that armed struggle was necessary in Guatemala to oppose the dictatorship. Uh, you, you've drunk that Kool Aid, but uh, you you weren't objective. You were doing what he calls called postmodernist anthropology. That was his his term for the whole enterprise, and that was a little bit like the uh, soak up debate. Mm -hmm. You remember that? It, in this guy writes this essay completely made up about I don't know he Heideggerian reading of physics or something like that, uh, deconstructive, something like that, and publishes it in Social Text, the big journal of cultural theory, advanced cultural theory, and then reveals that it's a hoax, that he just made it up, parody and essays about science he had read from postmodernist writer Foucault and stuff like that, right? So in a way, that's what Stoll was about. It wasn't. It's not totally unconnected to the right wing attack uh, that was still going on at the time, uh, because it added to the right wing attack. I don't think that was Stoll's intention, but I think that because Stoll was a liberal uh, person, not a right wing person at all. Uh, but the effects of his criticism. Uh, uh, that there was a lot of subjectivity in testimonial that one should be suspicious of its truth character, its claims on truth, and its claims on your feelings, too. Uh, uh, what was I going to say? I lost my thread there. Well, anyway. So, but we, we're almost out of time. In, in okay. fact, I, I was going to ask, so the, the last question, it's got two parts, I suppose. So one is the observation, and again, we were talking about this a little bit earlier on, um, that there seems to be uh, an exhaustion or defeat of testimonio at, at some point. And I wonder if you could talk about that. But the second part or the second element would be then, what does it mean to read somebody like Rigoberto Manchu in 2023 
after these 40, after all that's gone on in, in the last 40 years, and then perhaps in this new, you know, this new post-Trump, um, post, I don't know, post-truth as well, like uh, 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 atmosphere or environment in, in which we find ourselves. What can what can testimonio, and again, somebody perhaps particularly such as Rigoberto Menchu, uh, offer to our current historical conjuncture? Well, I, I think in a way, yes, it fades for two reasons, uh, three. Uh, one, it fades because uh, of the attack on its academic objectivity uh, by people like Stoll. Stoll certainly wasn't the only one, but he was the main one. Two, it fades because of the um, right-wing attack in general on left, progressive, solidaristic projects in the academy. The scandal that having a book like Vigoberto Menchu in the canon of Western literature was absolutely sensible idea, right? I mean, from the Bible to Vigoberto, who was a big reader of the Bible, right? As you know, many of her practices were come from the fact that she was educated as a, an explainer of the Bible. Uh, to Indian communities and Indian Absolutely. language. Uh, and, and, and the third, though, was uh, 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 boredom, uh, which is why we got into testimonio in the first place. We got into testimonio because we were looking for something fresh after the great novels of the boom and all the hyped up revolutionary culture, the Nueva Trova and politically correct kind of we wanted something new uh, uh, more direct uh, 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 not so caught up in a narrative of uh, humanistic benevolence to the lower like Pablo Neruda or something like that not Pablo Neruda speaking for the silent voices of Latin America but the silent voices of Latin America speaking instead of Pablo Neruda in a we were bored we were bored with the great achievements of Latin American literature and with Latin Americans. The achievements that had brought us into the field, but have now, by a, a lot, a formalist logic of defamiliarization, uh, become themselves too familiar and too uh, uh, pseudo essential. Uh, so we wanted something that would, just in a purely aesthetic sense, break with that familiarization. And testimonial was certainly that it did break with that familiarization, and you could you could enjoy the break in the form of a new form of language and a new form of narrative, uh, especially the language, the language, a uh, uh, kind of popular, more popular lower class Spanish, with mistakes and so forth and so on. Uh, uh, but then that happened to testimonial itself. Mm -hmm. It became familiar, uh, familiarized, and therefore it lost its aesthetic uh, uh, oomph. And when it loses its aesthetic oomph, it loses, in a way, its ideological oomph, too. The aesthetic and the ideological are totally tied up there in a question like testimonial. Now, I think, when you ask the question, I say, well, I, I think it might be interesting for somebody... <laughs> in a class on, say, Latin America today or something like that, or even more narrowly, uh, uh, to go back to testimonial and take it up again and see what's, what remained of it, what, what was there in the first place, what wasn't there in the first place, how it could maybe come back in a little bit. Uh, I've been impressed. Uh, I was drafted into a project on Literatura Cartonera, you know mm -hmm. what that is? Yeah. They had a big conference in Germany and Cartonero people showed up and we actually <laughs> made some Cartonera books. And I had the feeling that the Cartonera practice connected in some kind of way with what 20, 30 years ago was the testimonial thing, a new kind of practice, collective from below going around traditional publishers and sort of self-publishing in an exciting uh, new way. Limited, but interesting. Uh, 
So I, I would say if I were to take testimony off, I might connect it with the phenomenon like Cartoneda. Uh, there was a book by uh, Jose Rabasa's daughter. Do you remember? I don't, I don't know him. She did a very good book for the, the series we edited at Pitt, uh, Illuminations, on new circuits of book circulation. It's sort of an anarchist book, right? She's into anarchism and all these circuits of uh, John Holloway, that kind of thing, right? New circuits of production from below and exchange and in the production of books themselves. Uh, that short circuit, the... Uh, traditional hierarchy of the editoriales and stuff like that. So I would put it in connection with something like that. Uh, new social things going on in Latin America. Some of them evident in the new, uh, the new, new left, right? The new left that appears in the last couple of years it has a lot to do with street demonstrations. Like in Colombia, there were massive Arab Spring type street demonstrations a year, but many people were killed. And so that there's a kind of culture going on there that I don't think we have a, a good hold on yet in Latin America because it's a little bit in advance of what we do as professors or teachers. But it's there. And testimonial could come hook into that again as we study maybe their use of electronic media or uh, for direct forms of communication between different sites of struggle or... Uh, I think it's worth taking up again because while it went out of favor for a while, uh, it can always be brought back in, right? Uh, just the same way you can bring back in a crappy 19th century novel and say, well, it's kind of interesting to read this novel because it shows us a lot about what Latin Americans thought and believed, you know, Latin American upper class people uh, back then. And we can show see the holes in it, so... Well, I I, I the think system so. is always supposed to criticize, right? So, testimonial could come back in as something to be critically examined in a fresh way, uh, and in relationship to the new forms of cultural interplay. Uh, I, I certainly do think so. It's fascinating what you were just saying, and, and that would take us elsewhere, and, and and we don't have time about the. You know the electronic, for instance, the internet, the ways in which perhaps we we don't need or uh, people like Elizabeth Borges or Miguel Barnett are are not seen as quite so necessary in the same way as if you've got WhatsApp or a telephone uh, or or Twitter or, or or whatever. But then other kinds of intermediaries who are different from your Elizabeth Borges's and Miguel Barnett's may still retain a certain amount of uh, importance. But that takes us elsewhere, and 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 we are out of time. And uh, but John, this has been uh, really helpful, uh, a fascinating account of the uh, the rise and fall uh, of testimonial. What was at stake? in the debates and discussions about the genre and some thoughts there about why we might want to return to it now. Thank you so much uh, for your time and your expertise. This has been a, a fascinating and, and fantastic conversation. Thanks, John. Nice to connect after so many years. <laughs>